Hi everyone. So first of all, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Welcome to those of you who are joining us for the first time. Welcome back to those of you who are joining us for the second time and to those who participated in our August webinar. So my name is Angelina Vrisevic um, and I'm the Programme Manager for UK Postgraduate Awards. Um, and my colleague Tom Chadwick has kindly volunteered to join me tonight uh, to help me out with your questions. So the format of our event is very straightforward. Um, I have prepared a short presentation about 15 minutes long um, and the rest of the time will be dedicated to your questions. So before I go any further, I would like to note uh, that this webinar focuses specifically on postgraduate awards. Uh, last, year, uh, last time we did um, a Scholars and Postgraduate um, Awards webinar. This time it's a bit different. So if you are interested in Scholar Awards, um, feel free to, to stay and watch the webinar, but unfortunately I won't be able to answer your questions. Um, also, I do ask everyone to wait until the end of my presentation to start submitting questions, simply because every time you submit a question, I get notification and it can be a little bit distracting. So, right, let me just go back to sharing the screen with you. Just give me a moment. Right, so before I move on to the sort of like the main part of this presentation, um, I thought I would give you um, a brief overview of, of the selection process to demonstrate that the process itself is very straightforward. It's not scary at all. So it mainly consists of two uh, steps, which is the online application form, which is what I will be focusing on today, and uh, the interview um, step. Now, I will not be go uh, will not be talking about the interview uh, process at all, uh, simply because it's not going to apply to quite a few of you. Um, and those of you who are selected and invited to interview uh, will be provided with further information and sort of like tips on how to prepare. And the final step is the award confirmation. Um, again, that's that's very simple. So you're notified of of having been selected and nominated for an award. Uh, you're given some time to confirm whether you would like to accept the award and then your candidacy is confirmed by our board in Washington. So as I said, today I'm going to focus specifically on the online application form. So I will be reciting some of the materials from the previous webinar uh, simply because we are receiving a lot of inquiries about some basic things so I thought it would be quite useful to go through them again and then again if you have any questions about some of the things which uh, I'm not going to be raised in this webinar feel free to ask those. So just to reiterate, uh, the deadline for submitting your application uh, is 5 p.m. on Monday 9th of November, and I'm afraid we cannot be flexible. So you have to uh, put your application in before that time. Otherwise, unfortunately, you will be ineligible. Um, equally, we do not accept applications submitted via email unless we reach out to you directly and ask to submit to provide something to us via email. Uh, also, it is absolutely important uh, that you read the instructions available on our website. Now, it's quite a lengthy document, it's about 10 pages, uh, however, it tells you in detail what exactly you're supposed to be doing and what information you're supposed to be uh, providing in your personal statement and your study objective. I'm not going to go through that document today simply because, you know, it, it will take forever. Uh, so it's your homework to read that document in a way. Um, also, if you are applying for one of our partner awards, it is really important that you read the award description. Uh, very often our partners have additional requirements. So, for example, if you're thinking about applying for the um, Sir Cyril Taylor Award, uh, you need to have um, work experience beyond university. And this requirement is very specific to this particular award. Um, also, we are getting a lot of inquiries about whether it is possible to apply for more than one award or, for example, for the all disciplines and a partner award. And the answer is no. You can apply for one award only. It's either the all disciplines or one of our partner awards. One of my first tips would be for you to invest time in researching US universities and your programs. Um, you don't need to have applied for any uh, particular programs when you submit your application. You don't need to hold a place, uh, but a very important part of your application is your ability to demonstrate that you have done research and that there are very strong reasons why you want to be doing a particular program at a particular institution. And also please submit a supplemental form. Uh, the link and further information about this is available in the instructions. 
So the content of your application. Uh, now, the application itself is quite long, however, please do not get discouraged. Um, a lot of the information is uh, basically you providing short summaries of your experience abroad, for example, work experience or literally ticking boxes, so it's not you know, as scary as it seems. However, do you think about the information you're inputting, you're providing to us? Very often, after having read your personal statement, your study objective, we still have questions. And we go back to your application to hopefully find answers to those questions. So it is very important uh, that the information we're looking for is available there. Having said that, the two key elements of your application are the personal st uh, statement and the study objective. So these two elements in a way determine whether you will be invited uh, to interview. Again, I'm repeating myself, please consult the instructions. They tell you exactly what you need to cover in those two um, submission pieces. Uh, also, I would strongly recommend that you um, do some research on our website. And this is not just about you know, reading the section, how to apply and reading the instructions. Please do have a look at our mission, look at, uh, have a look at our statement. This will give you a much better idea of what we are looking for. Uh, Please be aware of the fact that each, oh, so both the personal statement and the study objective um, have a page limit. So you have up to one page uh, for your personal statement and two pages for your study objective. Now, you're not going to be disqualified if you submit longer uh, pieces of work. I guess the way to think about it is if you submit uh, one page and you know, three sentences for your personal statement, and I stop reading on at the very end of page one this is not going to affect the quality of your submission now if you submit two pages you know this is a completely different situation so the instructions are there for you and the, ex the expectation is that you will follow that um, also uh, do not try to over complicate your narrative especially when it comes to, uh, to your study um, objective by simply using a lot of very complex and clever words you're not going to guarantee yourself a place um, at, at the interview stage. It is also very important to keep in mind that some of the people who will be reviewing your application, such as myself, are not experts in you know, everything. Your project objective will be um, reviewed by the people who specialize in your academic field. So um, their assessment will be the kind of most important one. But we also want to see that you're able to uh, explain complex concepts to non-specialist -special aud audiences. Uh, we've also been receiving quite a lot of questions about um, references. So again, just to sort of recap, uh, we require um, three references and it's your responsibility to make sure that uh, these references are with us before the deadline. Um, at least one of your uh, references has to be academic, but it does depend on sort of the stage at which you are in terms of your academic journey. If you're applying for a PhD or to do some research, you will probably want to see more than one academic reference. And these should not be kind of generic character references. Your referees uh, must be able to comment on the academic strengths of your project and your suitability for the Fulbright program. Now, I often get asked about that one thing uh, which gets people selected uh, sort of to the next application um, stage, which is the interview process. Um, and the answer to this question is quite simple. There is none, and I, I genuinely mean it. The people we interview um, are able to display and demonstrate all the qualities we're looking for, although you know, they do so in very, very different ways. Um, I, something I really want to mention is the fact that your study objective and your personal statement are more important than the grades you have achieved. Um, and the university you went to or you're studying at, at the moment. Uh, if you have a first uh, from a Russell Group University, well, that's great, but that does not guarantee you an interview. Equally, um, if you have a 2-1 or a 2-2 from a non-Russell Group University, but you think that you have a good idea and you want to develop that in the US and you have good reasons for that, for that please do apply. I really want to have your application. So as I've said, um, we are looking for many more things than, than just academic excellence. We want you to be able to demonstrate your leadership potential. 
we want you to be to have cultural curiosity and not just to kind of learn from others but also to be able to share your experiences your expertise the culture you come from um, as i've mentioned uh we also want to know that you have a very strong rationale for studying in the us and going to the universities you have selected as this is an exchange program we also want to know that um, when you come back to the uk you will be keen on giving back whether to your local community maybe at the national level or maybe at the international level and finally but equally importantly we want you to have done some research about Fulbright and to demonstrate that you understand our values and and our mission and how and where we want to grow in the future um, additionally, if you are interested in applying for a partner award, I would strongly suggest that you check the website and social media channels. Do you remember that they will be reading your application as well, so you may want to show them that you understand what they're involved in, what they're concerned about, what they're working on. Um, so if you have any more questions or if anything isn't clear, uh, in the first instance, please consult our website. There is a lot of good information there for you. Um, if you know this doesn't help and you still have further questions, feel free to email us at um, programs at fullbright.org.uk. Um, and if you would like to discuss or uh, to have like a broader discussion with somebody uh, about studying in the US, maybe about um, other funding options available out there, how to research them, how to apply for those, uh, please feel free to contact our advising team who will be able to provide impartial advice to you. So that's it for today. And now we are opening the floor to your questions. I will stop sharing the If you would like to submit a question, uh, you should be able to use uh, the chat box. It should be Q and A box, I think. So. Yeah. It's Q and A. Sorry. Yes. Um, that's that's okay. Um, we have a question, Julia. Um, yeah. uh, this is quite a common question we get asked in the emails as well, which is whether or not we have statistics on the number of applications and the sort of number of successful applications, basically. Okay, yeah, that's an excellent question. And unfortunately, there is no straightforward answer to this question, simply because the statistics is very different for different awards. Um, so I can only confirm that the most competitive application is the All Disciplines Award. So just to give you a bit of an idea, um, we receive hundreds of applications for that particular award. And on a yearly basis, we are able, it does depend on multiple factors. So it's all very kind of generic, but we tend to be able to award about i would say on average 15 between 10 and 15 all disciplines awards uh when it comes to our partner awards again it really depends on the partner so i do want to make this brief announcement that we are going ahead with the BAFTA award this year we are still working on the technical side of it so i know that some of you have been struggling to select it as your um as the award you're applying for but it will be sorted out within a week or so so for example BAFTA is a very competitive award we don't receive hundreds of applications for it but it is, it, it is very competitive. With other awards, it may be um, 10 um, ap applications, especially if it's very, um, sort of like a very special, very niche award. So it does really depend on what you're applying for. So if you, if you think that you, uh, you would like to apply for a partner award, and if you think, or if, if you're quite sure that you meet all the requirements, those are going to be less competitive uh, than the all disciplines awards. Okay. Um, someone's asked if uh, if an application would be stronger if they already have a very clear idea of what university they want to go to and what course they want to study. Uh, yes, I mean, if I wouldn't necessarily say that it has to be just one uh, university unless it's a partner university, but this is basically what we expect you to do in the application, to tell us exactly why you want to go to University X and why you, you want to do that particular program. Very often uh, applicants tell us in their application that, for example, um, University of South California is their first choice, but they're also interested in going to Texas University and some, somewhere else. Um, because of these, these and these reasons. But would you expect you to uh, tell us exactly what you want to do um, and uh, where you want to do it? 
Uh, the next question someone's asking if you if we could kind of give some clarity on what we mean by giving back when come on upon return to the UK and maybe give some examples of what of how previous Fulbright scholars have, have gone on to do this. Um, I mean that's that's quite generic in terms of we basically want to see that you're planning to uh, to use your knowledge when you come back to the UK. For example, uh, some people tell us about how they're thinking to set up a particular business uh, to benefit the community they come from. Uh, the people who apply, for example, for HD, for PhD. Uh, mention how they're, you know, focused on coming back and teaching in the UK. Um, others are concerned with, for example, promoting cultural events. So it's it's basically about how you're going to use your knowledge when you come back to the UK. Uh, the next question: Someone's asked if they would be penalised for choosing an I for choosing Ivy League universities. Uh, we obviously do not penalise for that, but what we want you to do is we want you to give us a very good reason for choosing one. And by a good reason, uh, I don't mean saying that, you know, Harvard gives you fantastic opportunities to network. I mean, we know that. Uh, so it has to be something else. For example, a fantastic research centre or a specific member of staff who maybe you've been in communication already and have discussed your project and they're very keen on supervising you. Uh, so it has something beyond this, the status of the Ivy League itself. Um, next question is just asking if the scholarships that we, if our current website is that contains the up-to-date awards, I, I guess the only addition would be the BAFTA, which is on the website now. But um, yeah, the, the website as it stands uh, is the awards that are available this year. Um, another question that's uh, come up is, yes, yeah, so this is a, another common question. So if programmes are two years, uh, they understand that the funding is available for year one. Is there any ongoing support after the first year? Are grantees expected to self-fund? And I suppose more generally, like how do, how do grantees normally um, address that? Okay, so first of all, I would definitely encourage you to get in contact with us directly and we can discuss your personal circumstances. So I'm going to provide a sort of a very generic answer to your question, uh, hoping that you will reach out to us and we can discuss your situation. So yes, our funding is normally available for year one only. Um, we, some of our grantees do have enough savings or enough family support to fund year two. Uh, having said that, a lot of our grantees also apply for multiple other sources of funding, whether in the US or in the UK, and this is how they um, end up funding their second year. Uh, we also have the Opportunity Fund, uh, which is available to the people who have already been awarded an award. So you, you apply for it after your award has been confirmed in a way. Uh, so depending on your circumstances, you may be eligible um, on, on, you may be eligible for some additional funding, but normally it doesn't really cover all the expenses. So you will either need to uh, have some savings or apply for additional sources of funding. Having said that, we do have a number of grantees who have been able to pretty much fund the whole degree uh, with, with Fulbright, but those tend to be degrees that last somewhat like over one year. So for example, um, about 16, 18 months. And that's normally uh, not Ivy League institutions. Um, next question is asking whether or not you have to be doing a course to get a Fulbright uh, postgraduate award or whether you can also apply to do research or field work in the US as part of your for a Fulbright postgraduate award? Um, so if if this is part of your PhD uh, you can you can apply to to do some research um, at a university so that's uh, we pretty much consider um, any any postgraduate study especially if you're applying for the um, for the All Disciplines Award. The majority of our applications are for the Masters but it can be um, a research project. Um, another question, this is, um, there's a couple of questions about previous experience in the US. So if, uh, for example, if someone had completed a five month placement in the US last year, are they still able to apply for a, um, for, to go and do, a, in this case, a PhD with their US, existing US experience? Uh, yes, that in, in principle, the answer is yes. Uh, would you, if, if you've been to the US, it really depends on what you were actually doing there. So if, you've, if, if you were studying there, let's say half a year ago, a year ago, we will want to see how additional US experience will benefit, uh, will benefit you. And we do give preference to those applicants who have never been to the US and who may not have an opportunity to do so without Fulbright support. Um. 
some someone's asking about the the projects or projects summary um so when we say project does this mean that we need to, that the applicant needs to have a guaranteed research area when they submit their application or can it be a little bit more general um so in terms of the project most of the uh degrees do you have the sort of like dissertation or project component to them? And this is what applicants tend to talk about in their applications or in, in their um, study objectives. Having said that, we are obviously aware of the fact that some masters are much more um, applied. And in this case, we will probably expect you to elaborate uh, on obviously the program we want to do, what, what you hope to achieve within one or two years of your program and what you want to do uh, with with that particular knowledge you will have acquired. Uh, so I guess we, we just, you know, if, if it's sort of like more, if, if it doesn't have a research component, uh, we probably want to sort of like hear in a way what you're going to do with with, with that degree, why you want to study it and what, why you are interested specifically in that selection of modules, what it will give you. Um, the next question is asking if we're looking at particular, for guarantees of a particular age range or whether or not we welcome um, applicants at different stages in their career. We welcome everyone. Um, and the next question is someone asking about, um, yeah, so what's, is it, what's the situation for UK citizens who are currently living outside of the UK? Um, are they still eligible to apply? So as long as you are not in the US at the moment, uh, that's, that's perfectly fine. So as, as long as you're uh, a UK citizen, you don't have a uh, dual nationality, uh, it really doesn't matter um, where you are based at the moment. One thing to keep in mind is that if you're thinking to, at some point in the future, apply for a more permanent uh, status in the US, for example, green card, uh, you will need to spend at least two years uh, in your home country. And your home country will be defined as uh, the country where your Fulbright Commission is based, which is the UK in this particular case. Um, the next question, someone is asking if there are, we have different expectations for the study research objective uh, for applications for master's degrees versus applications for PhDs. Yes, of course, we expect a very different level kind of uh, of depth in terms of your research. And when it comes to a PhD, this is where you talk about your research, basically. So uh, this is where we would expect you to have a very clear uh, project, a very clear idea of what you want to do. Um, we would also expect you to probably have been in contact uh, with, with the members of staff at your selected institution, or at least that would definitely strengthen your application. Uh, while at the master level, obviously the expectation is different. And when we're reviewing your applications, we're obviously very aware of what you're applying for. Um, so if someone is asking what the average amount we award for the All Disciplines Award is, I guess this is on, on the website, it says up to $45,000. So I'm guessing, yeah, what, the, what we typically would offer. That's, I mean, it depends on your other um, funding. So it, yeah, it, it does depend on whether you manage to secure any other scholarships and what those scholarships uh, will be covering and how much money you need and how much support you get from the um, from your host institution, if any. Um, I can say that, for example, this year, so our um, 2021 group, um, those who uh, got the All Disciplines Award, uh, the majority got the maximum amount. Um. Someone is asking what weighting we give to the letters of recommendation. Um, and I guess, yeah, particularly given that um, for some people, like they might have been to university some, some time ago. Um, and um, I guess this is probably somewhere to stress that, you know, those don't necessarily need to be from your, although one needs to be from an academic supervisor, they don't all need to be from an academic supervisor. Yeah, that's, that's very true. Would you receive, um, I would say most of the applications come in with at least one professional um, reference, um, for example, you may maybe you did like an internship somewhere, or you volunteered. In terms of the weighting, we don't really have what like points for any application part. Um, I would say we obviously read your references, um, and I guess we are just looking for a confirmation that uh, you know your project is good, it's feasible, and why your referees think that you are you know a great candidate for our program. And as long as that is present we are sort of like happy with your references. That's, that's basically the gist of it. Um, 
someone has asked if whether or not um, if they were to obtain funding from the university they apply for, or indeed from another source, does this disqualify them from receiving their Fulbright award? Or basically, uh, can you have multiple it, pots it of funding? Does not, sorry, it, it does not in most cases, but as I've said, we will, we do have those conversations on a case by case basis with our grantees. And it does really depend on the amount of funding um, and uh, sort of how much money. Basically, when if you secured, let's say, lots of funding from other sources and you know, it covers all of your tuition fees, and your living uh, expenses, and you know, health insurance, everything you may ever need. This is like the hypothetical example where you know you may not get anything from us. But to be honest, that has never happened as far as I know. So even if you secure a very significant amount of money from your host institution, the likelihood is that you will still need money from like somewhere else. And uh, even if you have personal savings. As long as you know it's not scholarships coming from elsewhere, you will be eligible for our funding. Um, someone has asked about the new entrepreneurship award. Um, they're asking how many awards we have for that and whether or not we can explain why we've not included uh, Harvard Business School as a, yeah. as a possible. So it's it's a new award. We're very excited about it. Uh, it's one award. Uh, all our partner awards are like it's it's one award except for um, Sir Cyril Taylor. Um, Harvard School is not included because we have a separate partnership with them. Um, the ne this next question is one that comes up quite a lot, and um, which I think I'll save Angelina an answer, which is. Um, on the application portal, it will tell you that you should not mention any US universities by name. But if you read the UK specific application instructions, you'll see that um, we do uh, stress that you should mention the universities you're applying to. Um, and you should always defer to like the UK specific application instructions in your application. So if you're getting conflicting messages from um, our, our instructions and the portal's instructions, always go with our instructions. You won't be, be penalised. Um, do you want to add anything, Angelina, or is that...? No, that's, that's, that's it. That's good. Um, uh, oh yeah, so this is what's a good question about references. So does the reference have to, like, have knowledge of the Fulbright programme um, when providing a reference? Um, and I guess also maybe this is somewhere to talk about, like, how you can perhaps com communicate w your plans for your Fulbright to your references. Um, they don't need to know, you know, anything specific about the program. If I were you, I would probably send just a link to our website to your referee and say, look, this is the program I'm applying for. Uh, you know, these, these are the requirements. It would be great if, if you could let me know if, if you feel comfortable sort of like commenting on those things. Um, and yeah, this is, this is basically, um, I, I would say, especially if it's an academic reference, we will be looking primarily for like feedback um, on the academic strength of your project. Um, someone is asking if, you, if whether or not you can, um, if you apply for both a Fulbright scholarship but also for a sports scholarship at the same at the specific university. Yeah, that, that's fine. I mean, uh, in terms of your funding eligibility, it will obviously depend um, how much you're awarded by your host institution. But you, you are more than welcome. You are encouraged to apply for multiple sources of funding because we're obviously very realistic that at the moment, uh, you know the quite a few of our awards which we're offering um, are not sufficient to cover all the fees which will be incurred by US study. Um, a question is, that's also got an element that others, uh, other questions are also bringing up, which is, um, is wanting to collaborate with a specific professor or a specific research group uh, a good reason to choose a partner university? And then can a contact at your potential host university, such as a professor there, be one of your three references? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's a very uh, legitimate reason to be uh, interested in going to a specific institution. Um, they, we have had um, applicants uh, submit a letter uh, from their host institution. Normally, it comes as an additional piece of evidence, uh, simply because uh, normally the sort of, your, it obviously depends on your relationship with that particular professor or member of staff, but normally they don't know you well enough to be able to provide um, kind of a full reference. Having said that, if you do feel that they are able to comment on like everything, including the strength of your project, and they know you uh, sort of personally well enough to comment on, for example, your leadership potential, uh, then absolutely yes. Um, 
Uh, so yeah, so the question about the study objective. So how specific do we expect an applicant to be? Should candidates mention a specific area they're interested in for post-credit research or just a general research field they're interested in? Um, so I would say the more specific, the better. As you know, as we've already discussed, it does depend exactly on the program you would like to apply for. But we normally, if if you are able to provide a very specific research plan, uh, that makes your application quite strong. We do appreciate the fact that it doesn't necessarily mean that you know you will fulfil that plan one hundred percent. Things change, and I mean you're going there to learn things, uh, so that's perfectly fine. So you shouldn't really worry about that side of, of things but I would probably encourage you to make your study objective as specific as possible. Um, the next question someone's asked about um, whether or not we take the GRE score into consideration when assessing applications. No we don't require those tests. Um, uh, that's the reason for the previous question. Oh, yeah, is there a specific format that candidates should use for the personal statement and research study? Uh, no, not really. I, as, as I said, uh, please consult the instructions for some kind of further tips on what to include in your um, submissions. But in terms of the format, as long as you follow the um, page um, limit, it doesn't really matter. Um, another good question is, um, in terms of like articulating why people have chosen a particular university of course or course, are cultural reasons such as the particular city or an interest in that institution or that area of America, is that, are, that, are those valued alongside academic reasons and connections? Absolutely, that sounds that sounds excellent. Uh, we do, so in addition to kind of your academic interests, we also want to know uh, kind of that you are interested in the US, maybe in a particular state or a city or a country as, as a whole, that you are interested in something else in addition to academia. So if you're able to use uh, some extra reasons, uh, which are primarily focused on, let's say, the area you're going to, especially if it's one of the areas where not that many of our grantees go to, that, that would be excellent. Um, a more kind of technical question, someone is asking, the, the course they're interested in has a research semester abroad, which would mean that for one of their semesters they would be in another country that's not the US. Um, which would mean they wouldn't be in the US for the whole of their time with the Fulbright. Is this, would that course be eligible for a Fulbright scholarship? Um, I don't think I've ever dealt with this before. I would suggest drop us an email and we'll look into that further because it may have uh, visa implications. So our grantees, just to quickly add, have to uh, travel to, to the US on a very specific visa, uh, which can't be like open kept open indefinitely and they have to be present in the country so i may need to double check that for you uh, i don't have the answer right now so please do drop us an email and we'll look into that for you um another good question that uh, comes up a lot in the inbox is um are there a minimum number of universities that candidates should be expected to apply to for the awards that for something like the all disciplines award no not really uh it can be one university um, it can, I mean, there is no minimum or maximum. I would say be sort of like sensible. If you're planning to select 10 universities, the likelihood of you having a very good reason for studying at each of them is, is not very high, unless you're kind of, you know, willing to dedicate a whole personal statement, study objective to that, which, you know, means that you're not going to cover all the other things we're looking for. Uh, so I would say think about um, how you're going to address that particular aspect. But I would say on average, um, selecting three, maybe four, is kind of what we'd expect. Would you have applicants who want to go to one very specific um, institution? And that's perfectly fine. I guess in a way it makes it easier for you to justify your choice if, if it's just one. There have been a few questions from people asking, um, so for people that are currently in their final year of their undergraduate degree, um, asking if that would, you know, whether, whether they'd still be able to apply for a Fulbright award, um, for instance, without their final undergraduate degree result, or um, if they haven't got um, extra experience and stuff. Um, so yeah, basically, are you able to apply if you're still an undergraduate? Yes, of course, in terms of uh, your uh, certificates and your diplomas, um, 
if if you receive if you if you're offered an award, uh, it will be conditional on you uh, providing a copy of your um, certificate normally with a 2-1. Um, in terms of uh, not having additional experience, do review some of our applications because as I've mentioned with, for example, the uh, Sir Cyril Taylor um, Award, um, applicants are expected to have work experience. But if it's the all disciplines, um, you, you can definitely apply for that. Um, there's a couple of questions about uh, references again, but sp specifically for uh, people who've perhaps gra graduated a, a, some time ago or people who will be now working in a discipline that's very different to the one that they uh, studied as an undergraduate. So um, so one person asking if, you know, if, they, if they had their BSc was in, um, in uh, they had an undergraduate in, in a sciences degree, if they're now going to go and study creative writing, do they still need that academic reference? Um, another person's asking if they could submit three professional references instead of one of those academic references if, if they studied a long time ago. So in terms of jumping from one discipline into another, um, I specialize in neither. So to be very honest, my question would be, are you academically qualified to make that jump? Um, and, and if you are, and if our reviewers who specialize in your field confirm so, uh, then I don't really have a problem with that. The way to think about references is, Basically, do they provide the information we want? Do we get an impression that you're, you know, can your referee confirm that you are submitting a great project? Can they confirm that you're suitable for the Fulbright Pro? As long as these people are not your friends or family members, it will be fine. It's more the fact that um, we would expect, um, let's say, an, an academic lecturer to be able to comment on your project strengths uh, much better than, for example, your employer. Although again, it may depend on, on the sort of like area of work um, you're currently involved in. And the third question, so again, that, that probably answers the second question. Um, it, it depends on sort of um, what your three professional uh, referees are able to comment on. Um, a question about the Welsh Government Award. Um, how concrete do your plans to return to Wales have to be? As in, do you have to have something in place uh, before you apply that shows you're going to go back to Wales or is it simply enough to say that that's your intention and these are your plans following the Fulbright? Uh, I mean no one, I mean we always appreciate the fact that things do change so you don't need to have like a job contract for example to come back to like in two years time that would be you know, a bit realistic. Uh, we do want to um, we do want to read about your plans for the future and we do expect them to be quite concrete um and you know we this is a relatively new award uh we interviewed a number of very very strong applicants for it um and i must say you do get that vibe of whether the person is planning to come back to wales and then use that knowledge um or, or not really so i would say it, it's primarily about your plans um this is a good sorry i interrupted you um this is a uh, good question um are there specific parts of the application that kind of are used as like a screening tool? So for example, if someone's letter of recommendation is weak, would that lead to an automatic rejection before perhaps the personal statement you considered? Or do we look holistically at the whole application before filtering any applications out? Uh, would you look holistically, except for one thing, uh, would you check your nationality? Uh, would you receive, we're a big commission, and would you receive uh, a number of um, applications from the people who have nothing to do with the United Kingdom? Um, so in this case, th this is the first, if, if you indicate your nationality as something which is not British, um, this is going to be the first thing I will check. Um, Based on that, I always decide whether you're eligible or not eligible, and then we look at the application holistically. Um, a quick question, is there just one BAFTA award available this year? Yes. Yeah. Um, a question about the J1 visa. So if you go for a longer degree, such as a PhD, do you, are you able to renew the J1 visa for the duration of your time in the States? Yes. So uh, one of the benefits of the Fulbright Award is that you get uh, a personal um, advisor in, in the US who is based 
um, at the uh, Institute of International Education, we all call it the IAE. Uh, so they will be working with you throughout your whole program, even though you know we, we will be sponsoring you. So you will be getting from money from the Fulbright Commission in your first year, uh, but uh, the IAE will sponsor your visa for the uh, entire duration of your program, and they will be constantly advising you on what to do, what documentation to submit, when to do so, uh, to obviously not break the immigration law in the US. And the expectation is that you will remain um, on, on the J1. Um, another good question is, uh, so someone's asking if you can apply for the All Disciplines Award for a, for a, for a, a field that's also, that also has a partner award at a specific university. So for example, I think in this instance, they're looking to study for a, a law master's, um, but they would perhaps not apply for our specific law masters at, at uh, Indiana. So will they be penalized for not applying for the partner award if they're applying in a discipline? Um, no, no, not at all. Uh, we do sometimes, what may happen is that if, for example, um, we receive you know, a fantastic application um, and our partner award is more generous than the all disciplines, we may in certain cases suggest that the partner consider that application, uh, but we do not penalize uh, people for not applying for a partner award. Um, this question about um, uh, providing samples of work, which I think is also something that comes up a lot in the inbox, um, and they're asking whether or not sending a dissertation uh, an undergraduate education um, is is okay. Um, I'm not even sure we need samples of work from non-art subjects. No, um, unfortunately, especially if it's a long piece of writing, unfortunately we're not, we are unable to review, I mean your application is going to be about 40 pages and I will be reviewing hundreds of those. So um, unless it's um, one of the sort of more arts related degrees, and we do have a list on our website uh, and in the instructions of when you are expected uh, to submit a, a word sample. Unfortunately, we, we will not be looking at that. Um, there is, someone is asking if um, having, there's just a couple of questions are asking whether or not having evidence that a US program is interested in you coming to study there, or for example, having an offer of a place or having had a deferred place, is this something we consider? Is this something that gives a, 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 um, a candidate an advantage in their application? Um, it, it does depend. If you've been offered a place already, uh, I mean, would you want to know that? But I wouldn't necessarily say that it gives you uh, an advantage because a lot of universities take quite some time to decide um, on, on who they would like to offer places. So it's just, you know, a question of time. Now, we've had applicants who uh, submitted um, a letter from their department or normally from like a specific um professor, lecturer, member of staff basically, in which they very explicitly tell us about how much they would like to work with that person in their department and how important the Fulbright funding is to them. And I would say that would probably be some sort of advantage in your case, because that will probably uh, demonstrate the strength of your academic project. This is, this is how we would uh, look at it. Um. Can someone apply for a Fulbright alongside other non-partner scholarships, such as, for example, the Kennedy Memorial Trust Scholarship? Uh, yeah, that's that's fine. Um, again, it's, it probably goes back to you know what I've, I've said about other scholarships. You're more than welcome and encouraged to apply to as many uh, scholarships as you can. And it's it's very very common for our grantees to hold multiple scholarships, including ours, obviously. Uh, but we will be able to have a more detailed uh, discussion about this when all of your funding has been confirmed and we know um, what you have been awarded. Um, um, oh yeah, so someone's asking if they were to receive a Fulbright award and start a course, would they then be able to change their research interests or are you committed to uh, the research interests that you outlined in your application? Um, so it depends on kind of how much you want to change. So if, for example, um, you've gone for a program with a number of optional modules and in your application you indicate that you want to do you know x y z and then you go to university you enroll those modules and you realize mm, actually that's not really exactly what i want to do i still want to be on the same program but i want to slightly change my module selection that's fine now if you submit a phd proposal 
and then you completely change your idea and like now i'm doing a completely different project you have to check with us we again i don't remember that happened before uh but would you have that in our terms and conditions that if you want to change the sort of like the focus of your research or your study in the us you do need to discuss that with somebody um at the commission and uh, as well with your ie advisor um So there are a few questions about um, what what funding the award offers. Um, uh, so one is asking if there's a stipend, or, and there's another asking whether or not whether or not it's a, you know you receive a fully funding. Um, could you just maybe run through how people can find out information about that one? So if that's not yeah. annoying us. Yeah, yeah, of course. So. Um we do have multiple awards, so I'm not going to go through every single one. Please do go to our website. Um, our awards do offer different funding packages. So, for example, the All Disciplines uh, one is a, an amount of money which you have in your bank account, basically. Um, there are some awards uh, which offer um, a, a tuition fee uh, waiver, for example, the Indiana Law Award. Um, we have um, an award, do we have anything with a stipend? We probably don't have anything with a stipend this year. Uh, but it's, it's main, most of our awards um, are a, a specific amount of money. So please do read the description. Um, someone is asking if it's harder to secure a full funding or a Fulbright award for an Ivy League program, i.e. do we have a certain proportion of funding that we reserve for Ivy League colleges or do we, is, is that harder to think about? Uh, no, not really. The other thing which I've already mentioned is that um, it's, it's important for everyone to be able to explain why they want to go to a particular institution, but particularly so if you're applying to an Ivy League institution. So as, as I said, we want to, to read something in addition to fantastic networking opportunities and the kind of the ranking and you know all, 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 and how well known that institution is. Other than that, we don't really have like a specific percentage of grantees uh, we send to um, Ivy League institutions or to non-Ivy League institutions. Um, another question is asking if, um, is it okay if the institution they would eventually attend is different to the one they've mentioned in their personal statements? No, not really. So you are expected to uh, attend the institutions you um, identify um, in your application. Would you have situations when, for example, you select, normally it's like somebody may have two top institutions and they uh, select institution A as their first choice and B as their second choice. Um, and we give them an award based on that and then for some reason they decide no that now they want to go to institution b they do have to check that with me but in most cases uh, people do um have quite strong reasons for the change for example we had uh, a grantee this year who uh called both departments to discuss her project in a bit more detail and then she called me and said look i've had this conversation and actually now i realize that the um, institution b offers better curriculum based on my um, kind of professional development and what I want to do in the future. And that's perfectly fine, as long as uh, the institution you want to go to uh, was mentioned uh, and justified in your application. Um, sorry, I'm trying to see um, the next question. Um, uh, there's a question about the, um, basically about COVID-19. So um, a lot of grants last year were kind of cut short or maybe changed in some ways. So how is the how is the commission or how are we for this Fulbright think what's our Fulbright's thinking about this going forward? So that's not yeah, um, so um, we obviously don't know what's going to happen in the year's time. We still don't know what exactly is going to happen with our current students. Um, in, I can tell you a little bit more about what is happening right now and how we've handled this year so far. Uh, so everyone who um, has selected to start their course this year, um, so everyone has been awarded their award. We do have a group of students who were able to go to the US um, like at the end of August, early September. It's about like half of the group. And then the other half um, have started their courses online. Um, and most of them are expected uh, to go to the US in January. But obviously we will see how, how things change and how things progress. Um, we do obviously hope that by, by the next academic year, the situation will will be more manageable, shall we put it that way. Um, and there will be sort of international travel and international exchange will 
become more normalized but obviously we we don't know what will happen and we do depend on the guidance uh which we receive from the u.s state department so you know there are certain decisions which we don't make um as a commission uh, there's another question asking if we include funding for visa applications and traveling whether we have a travel grant as part of the award um, so in terms of travel, no, so that would be, uh, so you can use either part of our award or your savings to, let's say, book your flight. Uh, in terms of visa, so that's that's another benefit which comes with the Fulbright Award. Uh, we provide a lot of assistance and guidance. Uh, you don't need to pay uh, for your visa, so the visa fee uh, is waived, um, at least if, if you need to apply for multiple visas throughout your um, study, it's going to be uh, just the first visa, um, and so there are no fees associated with that. Um, and so far, our grantees have been granted um, priority service. Um, we have a question about dual nationality. So if you have dual nationality, uh, say for example, uh, British, Irish, uh, are you allowed to still apply for a uh, Fulbright Award through the UK Commission? Yes, absolutely. Um, as long as you're a British citizen and as long as you don't have a hold um, US uh, citizenship, that's, that's perfectly fine. And this question asking for a little bit more clarification about the two years uh, spent back at home after the J1 visa. So, for example, if you were to do a PhD, would you then have to go after your four or five year PhD, then go back and uh, spend two years back at your, at your home in your home uh, in the UK, basically? But yes, so you will be able to complete your programme and after that you will be expected uh, to come back to the UK. So there are a few things happening here. Obviously, as a commissioner, we expect you to come back and share your expertise. And this is where, you know, giving back uh, to the UK sort of comes in. Uh, in terms of sort of like the legal requirement, uh, this is a requirement in case you would like to uh, apply for a more permanent status um, in the US at some point in the future. So you will not be eligible for, let's say, green card unless you have spent at least two years um, in, in your home country. Um, again, I'm not entirely sure, but if, for example, you completed your master's um, and then wanted to apply for a PhD in the US, you may have an opportunity to do so, uh, but this is something for you to look into because this rule affects uh, very specific uh, residency types in the US. Uh, so, for example, if, if you've completed your full ride, you've come back to the UK, and then you just want to go and see your family in the US if you have any, or if you want to go as a tourist on your Esther visa, uh, that's perfectly fine. So, the J1 visa is not going to affect that. Um. So someone, a couple of questions about um, people perhaps looking to change um, career or change focus. So if someone, for example, um, is looking to use the Fulbright Award as a way to pivot from one career, say in engineering, towards something that was in a more artistic field, or another example, someone who's already got a master's um, and is now looking to apply for another master's in a different field, like what do we look for in terms of justification if people are trying to um, use the Fulbright to support a pivot or a shift into quite a different field to the ones they've worked in previously? Um, I would say in a way, you know, being very clear um, about your decision to change your career is, is in a way a reason. Would you probably want to, you know, uh, know a bit more about your plan, how exactly you envisage this, uh, what you think you will be doing with your new masters, um, how exactly you're going, for example, if you already hold one masters, how exactly you will benefit uh, from getting a second master's in a different field. Uh, but I would say that all, all these things are, you know, perfectly legitimate reasons. You, you would just need to elaborate very clearly on that in your uh, personal statement or your study objective. Um, so another question about someone who's held a J-1 visa in the past as part of an undergraduate exchange program. Um, if they were to apply again, do they need to have their old DS 2019? And if and is it compulsory to have a copy of that? Um, I think we, if if you do have um, your your DS 2019, I think we will be asking for that. Uh, if not, I I will. I don't remember this being an issue, and we definitely have um, students who have held a J1 in the past. Um, again, if you're concerned about that, please feel free to drop us an email and we'll look into that further. But generally speaking, I would say um, 
having held a J1 in the past, uh, it, it depends on the J1, but if, if you went to the US as an undergraduate student a couple of years ago, um, as part of some sort of exchange program, that shouldn't be an issue at all. Question about reapplying for a full battery award. So if you've applied previously, um, does that affect your application? Um, or specifically, if you've applied for one award and then you apply again for a different award, does this affect your application? No, it, it does not. You're, you're you know, very welcome to do so. Uh, that's, that's perfectly fine. Um, I, is, so if someone's asking if it's, if they're applying for a master's in the US but intend to go on to complete a PhD also in the US, is this, will this affect their application? Uh, no, that's, that's fine as well. You would need to do some research into like the whole visa situation. Uh, because as I said, we probably wouldn't be able to advise on, on that specifically in terms of like J1 and university sponsored visas. I think those are F1 type visas, uh, but that, that should be fine. Uh, question from someone who's the main choice of their main choice of university to go and study at has actually decided to postpone their applications this year for a 2021 start. Um, uh, I think this is specifically for PhD students. Um, so have we come across any other institutions that are postponing accepting PhD students for the 2021-22 academic year? Not or really. Um, no, it may happen. I wouldn't be surprised if, if that happened, but we haven't uh, come across anything similar so far. And I can also confirm that the guidance uh, again, we've had so far from, from the US is that um, awards cannot be deferred. Again, given you know the current circumstances, everything may change. Uh, but you, as, as far as things stand at the moment, uh, if, if you applied for one of our awards and then it transpired that you know, you're, you're unable to get a place at, at the university or your place um, has been deferred, you would not be able to defer um, our award either. We've mentioned um, other funding sources. Um, there's a question asking how, what those other funding sources might be um, or perhaps like where they might better go to research them. Um, so um, that would be mainly your host institution. So in the US, uh, it's, it's very, very common for um, universities to support their students um, and other scholarship bodies uh, either based in the UK or in the US. Um, I'm not um, qualified to advise on that. Uh, either drop us an email and we will direct you to the right people in, in our team or go to our website. We do have um, our Education USA advising team who will provide impartial advice to you so they they don't work with our awards uh, they they will provide they, they will basically give you a bit more information about all the kind of or different types of funding available out there and how to research them someone has asked if um whether it's possible to receive or whether you not you have to report any income that you receive during the program and whether this could lead to reduction in the award they received uh, i think uh, it's apparently in our rules Okay, so in terms of your earnings in the US, we, but I mean the commission, uh, so far have never asked for any reports. Uh, you would need, there may be some sort of like a tax situation in the US, but this is something you would be discussing with your IE um, advisor when you're already in the state. So unfortunately, we wouldn't be able to provide any, any advice specifically on that. But at the moment, we as a commission, we don't ask for that information. Um, so we take um, a couple more questions. Oh, yeah. I, uh, so this is. So I'm just, just going through these. So on, um, sorry, uh, there's a lot of things we've already covered. Um, Okay, maybe this is a good one to, to kind of think about. So if your research objections are broad rather than specific, will this impact negatively on the application, e.g. if you're choosing a course because of the breadth of modules it offers, will that be looked upon uh, less favourably than someone that's chosen a very specific focus course? Um, not, not necessarily. It's very difficult. It's a very kind of hypothetical question. It's very difficult for me to tell because it does depend on, on you know, we, we do assess our, our all applications holistically and it does depend on what the course is, what you're planning to do um, and, you know, 
why you're you're so interested in it. So as as long as you cover, um, I wouldn't necessarily say that we go for like your know, very specific courses, or, like very applied courses or very not applied courses. It is very much about how you structure your uh, study objective and what information you provide there. Um, I think this question has already been covered, but maybe it's worth hammering the point home. So if you receive university financial aid or a scholarship from your uh, host university after you've been offered a Fulbright grant, does this will this lead to your Fulbright award being rescinded or changed? Um, I mean, we have those conversations in June, July. We, we, so I have those conversations with my grantees in June, July. So by that time, uh, most universities uh, or other um, scholarship bodies um, inform their applicants of, of the outcome. Um, so when you get your final offer, your final, and, and that normally happens, I would say in, in July, uh, your final offer tells you exactly how much you're being awarded, and that's pretty much final. Um, and we can take one more. One more. Um, just to find this quite a general one. Okay, this is it. So, um, if we've talked a lot about looking at the application holistically, um, what are sort of are there any parts that are particularly important out of the six things mentioned at the start? Or um, and I think I think I think this refers to the list of things we look for in mm -hmm. grantees. Are, are there any of those that were particularly important, or do we kind of look for a balance of those? Or it's it's a balance. So we, as as I said in my presentation, uh, the people who are invited to interview ultimately demonstrate all of those things uh, and based in different ways. Uh, so it's it's not that you know your leadership potential, how well amazing it, it may be, uh, is going to be more important than, for example, your cultural curiosity. Would you want to see that you demonstrate all of those skills? And I guess this is one of those kind of special things about, about the Fulbright program. It's not just about your academic excellence. It's not just about why you want to go to the US. Uh, it's about lots of lots of different things which you can express and demonstrate in so many amazing ways. And we know that because we read your applications. So we're going to finish now. So um, thank you very much for your participation. Thank you very much for your very intelligent questions. Um, it's, it's been you know, great interacting with you. Uh, we are thinking to run um, another uh, webinar in October. Now, we haven't really decided on the format yet. Uh, so I'm going to ask you if you do have any ideas, if you think there is something you really want to know about and that hasn't been covered or you would like to know more about something, please do drop us an email at programs at fullbright.org.uk. We do really want to uh, have your feedback. So that's it for today. So once again, um, thank you very much for joining us um, and enjoy your evening. Bye bye, everyone. <laughs>